Hello, everybody. I'm Jean Cook, Director of Programs for Future of Music Coalition. Welcome to the next panel, uh, which is actually going to be a conversation. This is going to be the third of four conversations that we've been spotlighting at our conference that are looking at the experiences of individual musicians from different areas of the industry, particularly looking at how their income is different from each other. Um, this one's going to be the jazz conversation. It hardly needs to be said that jazz is a crucial part of America's musical heritage. What might need to be pointed out is that jazz is a living art with talented composers and performers building on tradition and breaking new ground. But how are these artists faring in today's environment for music? Has their revenue picture changed in the past decade? And if so, how? And what can we do to ensure that these ambassadors of American culture can con continue to make music and evolve the genre? Joining us in conversation today, we'll be hearing from Karen Kennedy, a manager who works with jazz legend, pianist Kenny Barron, rising talents like Thelonious Monk competition winner Gretchen Parlato, and stars like pianist Jackie Terrison and vibraphonist Stefan Harris in between. She'll be in conversation with Patrick Jaron Watananan from NPR Music, who's also the editor of NPR's A Blog Supreme. Please welcome our discussants. See, we do have improvisational skills. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, having us. My name is Patrick Jaron Watanan, and I'm with NPR Music. Uh, and uh, I'd like once again to thank the Future of Music Coalition for having me here. It's such a great organization. Uh, I've been uh, so uh, so happy with their work uh, over time. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with Karen Kennedy, who uh, works with some of my favorite artists. Thank you very much, and I'm glad that, to see that some of you guys stuck around for uh, the jazz portion of this program, because it's something that's near and dear to both of our hearts. And uh, Patrick and I have been working together for a few years now. He, I just have to take one second out to say, um, it's brilliant the kind of work that he's been doing, because not only has he brought a fresh voice to a genre of music that's been around for uh, a wonderful length of period, but has always been associated with people who are, let's just say, above the age of 30. And Patrick represents not just a fresh look at jazz, but a portion of jazz that is changing, and we're really happy to see more and more young people uh, under the age of 30, and under the age of 50 even, that would qualify as young in jazz, um, coming into uh, not just the musician side of it, but all of the promotion side, all the marketing side, and particularly the um, people who talk about jazz and spread the news of it. So he has a, a wonderful um, online uh, program called A Blog Supreme, which you should check out because it's always interesting. So that's my plug for Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Karen. Uh, so we're here to talk about uh, the income streams that come specific to jazz artists. Uh, I guess, uh, I guess the thing that I wanted to start out with is the fact that jazz artists see themselves very much as live performers. And I think we have a chart up here which, uh, which breaks down some, you know, sort of the projected revenue streams of your artists. And uh, uh, I think one of the, the key figure, the elephant in the room, of course, is live performance fees. So I kind of want to break down where that is and where that's coming from. Uh, you know, as jazz artists are, you know, center themselves around improvisation and uh, playing for an audience, um, jazz is very much a live music, and, and so it makes sense uh, that uh, that musicians end up getting a lot of their income from there. Uh, what do you? How, how does that break down? You know, what kind of um, what kind of what kind of gigs create that sort of revenue? It has actually changed, and I'm glad we're doing this. Over the last ten years. I think most people associated jazz musicians' performances with jazz clubs, and those are, can be anywhere from a club of the size of 50 to maybe 75, 100, 125 uh, capacity, and that's been the tradition in jazz. But uh, with, over the last 10 years, there's been more of an effort made towards uh, performing in performing art centers, uh, large venues, uh, concert halls, uh, capacity of maybe 400 and above, all the way up to um, maybe two and three thousand. That has been, I think, a result of 
money flowing into those performing arts centers from donors who wanted to broaden their uh, programming from traditional classical to incorporate jazz, which is you know, significant to America's cultural history. So with that, there were many performing arts centers who started a series of jazz programs during their season. So maybe they would present a jazz performer four times a year. Sometimes it was only once a year, but it was an introduction for uh, jazz musicians to play to a much broader crowd, much larger crowd, and a different crowd. The people who attended performing arts centers are usually subscribers. So they might subscribe to a season and see you know, Bob Dylan one, one night, and then you'd see Kenny Barron another night. It was a great introduction for jazz to start adjusting how we, um, how we perform as well, because it wasn't just the intimate setting. Now you had to portray um, your vision, your, your craft, and what was your, your story to a crowd of you know, five, six, maybe 10 times as large as what you're, you're used to doing. So that has, a cha has been a change over the last 10 years. And now, I would say, for, especially for my clients, most of their performances, I'd say maybe 85 to 90% of those performances are at either a performing arts center or a festival, and maybe 10% at clubs. And if you break down the income of that, I'm sure the performing arts festival and festival uh, engagements are more lucrative. Seeing, I mean, if you look at this from the sort of supply side angle, you know, we're talking here a lot about the labor market of, of musicians and, and where, where their demand, where demand for them is uh, available. But you know, if you talk about this from who's willing to fund these performances, a lot of it is being sought by, uh, by the performing arts centers, by nonprofit organizations and uh, uh, other groups which would seek, I don't know, where is this coming from? Is it coming from government grants? Is it coming from private? foundations? Well, let's forget the government grants. Those don't exist anymore. Um, the, most of the performing arts centers are dependent upon their money coming from a diff couple different sources. One are donors, which certainly with the economy crashing in the last couple of years, that has been a major, um, had a major effect on those performing arts centers being able to either produce a season the way they're they normally do, or even some of them actually not being able to produce a season at all. And we certainly have seen that where I've had uh, even contracted um, um, concerts being canceled because the money hasn't flown through to the performing arts centers from their traditional means of, of sources. And again, those are usually donors, independent donors. Uh, some of it will be um, subscribers, of course. And then some of it um, is derived from grants that are either from nonprofit organizations. NEA does do, you know, used to do a little bit of a grant program, uh, Meet the Composer, Chamber of Music America is a major uh, funding pro, uh, access for jazz through the Doris Duke um, Fund, which has been probably the single most the single most effective program on jazz, I would say, in the last 10 years, not just from a research point of view, but certainly in terms of providing money to organizations to then help musicians either compose new music and then perform that music, or to help organizations bring in musicians that they couldn't normally afford to do. Such as NPR, you know, the Doris Duke Found Charitable Foundation found uh, support some of our specific to jazz programming as well. Uh, I think one of the interesting things that people who aren't necessarily familiar with the jazz touring circuit uh, would find interesting is that a lot, of, a lot of the more lucrative gigs are overseas. In fact, it's very difficult. Uh, you know, a, a fellow named Mike Reed, he's a, he's a sort of community activist. Uh, he books a lot of shows in Chicago. He's also an excellent jazz drummer. He's got one of the best uh, one of my favorite groups going. Uh, he, he was supposed to be here, and uh, when, he was, when he was here in, in town, uh, he just set up this sort of very DIY tour, and he played the Black Cat backstage, uh, which is to an audience of, say, 30 people, which is normally reserved for rock bands coming through. And, uh, you know, it was a great gig, but, you know, afterwards, afterwards I was talking to him, and he was saying, man, it's really hard 
to put together a tour in the U.S. You know, it's almost it's almost a little bit discouraging. Uh, so I wonder if you could talk about you know how much of your your artists being relatively successful artists uh, and you know internationally known artists get to play overseas and how much of their performance income comes from there. It's really interesting. That's another thing that has changed over the. I'd say really over the last five years because, again, well, for two reasons. One is that traditionally jazz musicians would always spend the summer in Europe and you would tour for six weeks in Europe and then the rest of the year was pretty much spent between Europe and the U.S. Nowadays, if you get a two-week tour during the summer in Europe, you're doing great. And usually that means that you are on an all-star tour. So it's not really your band that you're taking out. You're a part of a band with other leaders that promoters have decided that's who they want to see because that's who they think their audiences will pay to see. And it's a, a, it's a difficult uh, issue for artists who want to present their own vision and their, and their music, but then if they want to work, then maybe they have to take these all-star gigs so that they can make the kind of money that they need to support their, their family. Most of my clients spend a fair amount of time, I'd say maybe a quarter of the year in Europe versus the rest of the year in the US and South America. I do have uh, a, a client that spends, it's the reverse, maybe a quarter of the year here in the US and most of the year in Europe. And then I have a client who hardly ever goes to Europe. And partly that's out of choice and partly that's out of the demand for him is so great in the US and, and uh, South America that there's not much time left for Europe. And there's only a couple seasons to tour in Europe. But in terms of the money, which is probably what you, you want to know, the last uh, three to four years, the Europe really started cutting back on paying big, fun, big fees to, uh, to jazz musicians about maybe four or five years ago, when they realized that they could get Erica Badu or um, Eric Benet or name, let's say Rod Stewart, who's decided that they, you know, at a certain age they can do jazz. So they've decided they want to play on the jazz festivals. And the jazz festivals said, yes, because we know we can increase our ticket sales by having Rod Stewart sing, you know, from the American Songbook. Is it jazz? We're not gonna get into that conversation. The problem is that I'm all for Rod Stewart coming to jazz, uh, jazz uh, festival because they say that will bring in more jazz fans. However, then he should be paid the same amount of money that any top level jazz musician would get. That's not the case. So what's happened is that you'll pay, for instance, a Rod Stewart high six figures and that leaves how much money for the jazz people who've been working you know, 15, 20 years or even two or three years? That budget all of a sudden gets uh, shrunken down. So where, for instance, an a average fee would be 15000 to come over and do a festival, and out of that you would take your, your transportation costs. Say you get 15000 now all of a sudden you're being offered fees of seven or 8000 and sometimes less than that. And once that pattern started, it has not gone back. So the amount of money that you can make from going to Europe has really diminished, and now it's become very difficult to actually mount a tour to Europe, especially if you are an entry-level uh, musician, someone who's maybe has one record out and has a little bit of buzz, but the fees that you're getting offered for, uh, to come over and do a round of festivals and or clubs combined max out at maybe 2,000, 3,000 euros. Typical is maybe 15,000 euros. So that's about $2,250 to come over and do a performance, pay your band, and by the way, pay to get from, say, JFK to Paris. Not easy to do. So what ends up happening is that the leader usually makes no money, and I mean zero, and if you have a label and you can get some tour support, that's great, but most labels, as you know, don't exist anymore, especially in jazz. So you have independent labels and they're fortunate to be able to put the product out in the marketplace and maybe take an ad out in jazz times. So there isn't the resource available to mount a tour the way you 
could have five years ago, especially not 10 years ago. What we're faced with now, you still have to tour because why this figure up here that says 62% of your income comes from touring. So you still have to go out. You have to make um, decisions on who's gonna get paid and how much are they gonna get paid. If you are a side musician, you're in some ways much better off than being a leader because your fee is your fee. You're gonna get paid that first. The leader gets paid last if there's money left over. Forget about management, we don't go into that. We already figure out if you're working with an with a, uh, entry level artist, you're not gonna get paid for several years. You have to be willing, willing to in, make that investment. So in terms of how the money breaks down, you, on, on any given budget that I would do for an artist, going out on a tour. Nowadays, I have to take 50% of that budget and just give it to the airlines. Doesn't matter which airline, it's 50% across the board. Used to be 30% uh, three years ago. It was about 30% of our total budget. Now it's 50%, and there's no arguing that. What do you do with the other 50%? About 20% uh, of that goes to the side musicians. And then, depending upon who you're working with, if you have an agent and have an and or a manager, then you're looking at anywhere between, if you just have an agent, it could be 15%. If you have an agent and manager, you have anywhere between uh, 20 to 30%. What's left is for the leader. So it's a small pot that we all share. And the idea is that if we can share in it long enough, that pot will get a bit bigger. And ultimately, we can get to the position where uh, a number of musicians that I know are able to make incomes of $100,000 and over. That's not bad um, for most people. And that can occur based on your level of, of ability to take advantage of when you are hot and try to develop a diverse income stream and be willing to adjust yourself, not so much to the marketplace, but to what you're hearing inside and what's really be, being clear about what you want in terms of your career and being able to hang in there for the, for the long haul. So, uh, yeah, a good one though. Uh, you, you mentioned something really interesting at the end there, you know, adjusting, I think it was adjusting, you know, diverse income streams. And I wanna get to that in just a second, but before, before we move on, you know, we're, we're talking about how a lot of gigs these days, especially for your artists, are happening at performing arts centers uh, uh, and festivals and that sort of thing. What do you, does that have any implication for how jazz is viewed or how jazz is being perceived these days? That's a great question, absolutely. And it's for a benefit. Because once you get into those performing arts centers, you start changing the brand of jazz to the, to, for the good, I think. It's out of the idea that people have, oh, it's, you know, there's a bunch of people who either do drugs and, or drink and you, know, you have to be downstairs in a smoky, dark club and you have to be in on everything and know what's going on in order to appreciate it. We've taken it out of that, that you know, some of that of course still exists. And you wanna have those clubs because there's, there's an intimacy that uh, is shared between the audience and the musician when you're in close quarters. That can still happen in a large setting, but what, also happens is that more and more people hear about jazz and associate it with something that is not just um, refined, but it's evolving. And that's what jazz is about, is an evolution of culture, an evolution of um, a musical conversation that reflects the social uh, situation that's going on at the time. So in terms of the benefit that I think that we get from going into performing arts centers and festivals is that you're just exposing your story and your vision to a much larger group of, group of people that wouldn't necessarily go into a small jazz club, wouldn't even know where to go. And these are people who generally subscribe to a series of, of diverse uh, programming. So it may be their first association with jazz, which is why it's critical that that uh, presenters allow not just the really established jazz musicians to be uh, to perform at these PACs, but up and coming musicians as well. Do you think that there's anything that it's that that's you know sadly lost in that time? In going to performing arts centers? Yeah. No, actually, I don't see a downside at all. Uh, for one thing, it's and and I'll tell you 
I was trying to make a brief story. Uh, Stefan Harris is one of my clients, and he's a vibraphonist and marimbas and composer and educator. When he first came out 10 years ago, I remember uh, we, we did a, um, a showcase at a tiny club called Smalls in New York, where it is very tiny. We had a lot, we had, at that time, there were probably five or six record labels. We invited them all to come. We invited publishing people to come. We invited friends to come. And so there, the idea was to create this buzz, which is what happened. One of the record label uh, A&R guys who was there said to me, you know, Karen, I love Stefan. He's amazing. He's great, but he plays the vibraphone. What am I going to do with that? And my response to him was, you don't have to do a thing because we're not selling the vibraphone. We're selling the artist. And that told me that wasn't a good match for us. But at the same time, what we decided was we're in selling the, the artist and not the instrument. And given what Stefan wanted to do in terms of wanting to have education to be a big part of his career, we decided that we were not going to focus on the clubs and go that traditional route. We were going to focus on performing arts centers. And we were able to make our case because Stefan, um, unlike many other people at that time, had not just an undergraduate degree, but a graduate degree from uh, um, in, in, in music, and he was always interested in education. Performing arts centers, by far, um, more than any other institution, have an educational program associated with presenting uh, um, performers. So that offered an opportunity for Stefan not only to develop his craft in terms of educating, doing clinics and workshops, but also to develop a name as an educator. And now, 10 years later, he is one of the most sought after people um, as an educator and he loves it and that's sort of where we're diversifying and putting more focus on education and less on live performance. Uh, I think uh, wanna, we have to wrap this up pretty sh shortly, um, but uh, we did want to mention some of the other, what, what replaces live performance. So if you go real quickly, you were talking briefly about education. E education is the biggest one right now, uh, partly because there are over 200 jazz programs in colleges, let alone those in high schools. So the opportunity for those who have that skill in teaching to go in and do clinics and workshops or long-term residencies, which may be a week or so, uh, and can be as lucrative as performing. Though there are many more people at a younger age who are now teaching on uh, either as an adjunct professor or as uh, full-time professors at some of these colleges around the country, um, Oberlin being a big one, Michigan State being another, as, as NYU in the, in, in the city. So more, more musicians at, say, mid-level are also teaching as well as, as, tra as uh, touring. And that's a benefit to those schools because they get teachers who do and not just teachers who know the classroom. And so it's beneficial all around. Uh, the other, I think, major uh, source that's expanding are commissions and grants, where musicians nowadays realize that they have to go out there and find their work. It's not coming to them. So by writing some of these uh, grants that allow them to either do new commission work or create a, uh, Chamber of Music America has a, has a wonderful program called New Works where anyone of any level can apply for this grant. It just has to be in a chamber, um, a chamber organization, which means three or more people, three to 10 people. So you can create a new program of music for your band and go out and tour it because they support it with, with funds to tour as well. So I think that's two of the other ways that more people are going, going into. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, I think we have to close up here, but uh, I want to close with one anecdote. I know of one, one young pianist in the house, I think today, uh, I won't out him, but uh, he was a re recent recipient of a Chamber Music America grant. He's around my age, uh, and uh, he also just graduated from Northwestern University which is a very talented music program, so he's very familiar with those realities that we've been talking about. Uh, my thanks again to the Future of Music Coalition. Uh, are we able to take questions? No, I don't think we have. Uh, all right, let's hurry up. We'll do one.
There's a number of performing arts centers who have what are called black boxes. They have smaller theaters, 200 to 400, which is a more intimate setting. And a lot of times the jazz series are programmed into those smaller venues. Rarely do they get into the, the large venues. And you know, there are many other classical programs that have the same problem. So it just depends on how long you're gonna be committed to developing the audience for jazz. Uh, I think what the, the, the the gentlewoman from uh, Indiana University is referring to is a study by the Jazz Arts Group. Monica, of course, uh, is referring to as a study by the Jazz Arts Initiative, Initiative yes, uh, uh, based in Columbus, Ohio, which found that more intimate venues are uh, generally more conducive to young audiences. Um, and there's more, in, more details at their site. Uh, I do think we have to r wrap it up. Um, so <laughs> thank you, everybody, for uh, allowing us to be here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Patrick. So much.